South Africa's social hero is proof that anything is possible. Having graced the pages of leading online and print media, from Drum to Forbes, Becky's entrepreneurial dream supports over 40 people. He employs eight and educates over 30 through his internship academy. But his life wasn't all a dream. With a journey that starts in a prison cell, it is proof that once you've hit the bottom, you can only go up. This is a story of a young preneur. If you were to describe me in three words, it would probably be health, wealth, God. The way I see things is if I could ever focus on my relationships, relationship with myself, relationship with God, relationship with people, you know, people who are key, everything in my life changes. You know, I've got a business today and people in different places that open up new doors because of relationships. Mm -hmm. So they're very important in what I do and in my life. Um, wealth, I grew up with no, no, no. I grew up in like um, harsh situations. So wealth wasn't something we really knew about. But when I really discovered what wealth was, it wasn't really money that you get. It was money that you keep and, um, and keep growing. So to me, that's a very important part of my life. And then health is obviously an important factor of my three pillars because What's wealth if you're unhealthy? What's relationships if you're unhealthy? Um, some of the toughest challenges I've ever encountered would probably be um, expulsion from school. And that was kind of tough for me as a child, not understanding why my friends don't play with me anymore, why I'm segregated from every other people, you know. Yeah, so that was really a bit of a big challenge and obviously being exposed to all these other different things that you get into when you get in trouble with uh, the wrong side of life. I was expelled from school for hitting my grade eight teacher with a hammer. In 2001, I was um, in Rhodes High and basically um, life wasn't that great. Um, I had tried to be removed from my class where my teacher was kind of doing things which were kind of hurting me emotionally um, as a 12 year old or 13 year old, you know, um, from things like reading my journal to this class and having kids speak about my dad that's in prison, which were emotional things to me and they had emotional ties, you know, um, to always sending me out to do things while speaking about me to other kids. I mean, I remember the one day which really kind of hurt me was when I came back from being asked to go get paper from another class and I came back and the guys were speaking about my poverty status, like Becky's on TV, but he lives in a garage in Hedefeld, you know? And to me as a kid, I couldn't understand who knew that besides myself, who might have been writing all these things in my journal. So a lot of my private life was exposed to masses and masses of people. And uh, this continued for over about months and months. And I kept asking my mom, you know, to kind of go to another school, but that was the only school I could go to. Until one day, um, she sent me to the principal's office and she'd been reading my journal and I kind of grabbed that. And uh, she sent me off to the principal's office where the principal kind of uh, violently snapped the journal out of my hands, you know, where he choked me for a while, lost my breath, and out of snapping and reacting situation, I just ran back to class and um, there was a hammer along the corridor because I think they were fixing the, the broken window. Um, and I just grabbed that and started hitting my teacher and I was expelled from school, so. That was one really harsh situation, but life beyond that and after that was just really, really a bit of a spiral to hell, I'd say. One greatest thing I've ever heard from my family in saying, Peggy, it's all about faith. What do you believe about yourself? You know, so they've supported and been with me and not neglecting to tell me that, hey, dude, that was wrong. You don't try that again, you know, so I learned a hell of a lot from them, but in terms of friends and people around me, life just became different, eh? Like, everyone just treated me like I was a very, very notorious criminal, you know, like this 12-year-old kid, like, some even nicknamed me the pioneer of high school violence, you know, which was, 
I didn't necessarily like that. I didn't want to be that. It was a situation of just snap and react, you know, and I wasn't really proud of that. So people stopped hanging out with me. Families kept saying to my friends, don't play with that kid because he's a negative influence. And I mean, I went to juvenile detention and you just exposed to a whole new different life that you're not even part of, you know, so things were just harsh. For me as a person, one of the greatest things I ever learned probably from my, um, my, my roommate would probably be one day when I said, hey, my man, Etienne, I think I've just screwed up my life, you know. And he said to me, um, until you actually believe that your life is screwed up, your life is not screwed up, big, you know. And that day I kind of scratched my head and thought, um, so what do you mean? And he's like, what you believe is what you become, you know. And it's where I started kind of trying to understand why he was thinking differently, what was... And I spent some time with Etienne and I found he was reading quite a lot and studying all these successful people and I started joining him, you know. And, and I think juvenile, one of the greatest things I'd probably take from being in hell is that if you're locked up in this room, you dream of all these possibilities you could be doing outside. But the biggest problem is you're locked up in this room, you know. So it, it ignited dreaming because you're locked up. I can always say that being in juvenile just ignited the dream, uh, the passion for trying and believing things that I can't really do, you know. Going to prison as an adult has been something I've been told and forced to believe, you know, um, by plenty people. And I had a lot of people just say, Peggy, you'll probably just end up just like your dad because I mean, I've never really seen my dad outside of prison at that time, you know, and he'd never been out from the time I was a kid to when I was 12, 13, you know, the only time I see my dad is behind bars. And people just started saying, you're just following the footsteps of your dad. And that was, tough, yeah. that was one of the toughest things. I was expelled for my wrongdoing but after that, I was still expelled from Sipo Nye, Cambridge College because I was Ubik. And that was a very long challenge and I faced depression for almost a decade of my 12 years to probably being 20. Couldn't get into school, couldn't... And I think the harshest thing is that they keep saying education is the key to your success or something along those lines, but I'm not allowed education, you know? So it's still very hard, I won't lie, it was one of the greatest battles I've ever been through. And I remember committing suicide when I was expelled from like the fourth school. Because I mean, I kept trying and what I kept doing was, look, my name, Peggy Kunen, is getting me into trouble now because everyone, there was tabloids, newspapers, everything, writing about Peggy Kunen. So I decided, well, okay, cool. My name on my ID, that's when creativity started coming up. My name on my ID is Peggy Sisa Opet Kunen. So I thought, well, look, Peggy, how about the Opet? So I registered as Opet Kunen, and cool enough, they didn't know Opet was Peggy Kunen. Did school for um, a few months, and someone said, yeah, Peggy, in front of the principal, and the principal was like, huh? Why is he calling you Peggy? And I was like, well, my name is Peggy Sisa Opet Kunen, to kind of hide the Peggy part, but still, I was expelled a few days later. The principal called me in and said, hey, look, I didn't know you, the Becky. So I was still titled the Becky. I had just given up on life, you know, as much as I was free, but I couldn't do anything. Like everything was closed. Whatever I tried was just not working. So one of the few things I had really encountered is life after that juvenile was even harder. It all started when I basically um, had failed in anything. It was a real weird situation where, you know, you, you try and kill yourself and you fail. You try and get school and you fail. And you try anything and you just fail and you fail and you fail. An idea came about from my parents when they said, maybe the last option is to try God. Mm -hmm. 
I wasn't a religious kid at all at some time in my life. So I went to church. The closest church was Jail's Vine. And I went to Jail's Vine and I, I started going to that church. And um, I heard Mfundisi, one of his sermons was around mind change and how people think, which causes them to be different. And he said that, I remember those words quite clearly when he said, Angeze. And his sermon was around that. And I, I was like thinking, so what does this mean? And he's, he explained it as you can't be born or in a situation and die in that situation. And he started explaining how it's all up to you to go from this situation into this situation. So I started becoming inquisitive and started developing faith and hope. Um, until one day Mfundis, he started becoming closer to me and uh, speaking to me because I think he found out about my life so he called me in and said hey Peggy I heard about your crimes and your life story and the first thing I remembered was you know I've always been exposed to that when someone finds out that I'm the Peggy they kind of throw me out of their life and I was expecting that so when he started speaking to me, I was just thinking like, yeah, whatever, he's probably just not going to allow me to go to church or anything. But what he said kind of changed my life. You know, he said, Biggie, why are you looking even angrier at me that I've called you in to speak about this than you were initially? And I told him, look, it's normal. People hear about me and they find out about me and I'm expelled from anything. So I know you're going to do that. So you might as well do it. And he said, no, Becky, no, I would like to actually change the way you think and expose you to the other side of your mind. And that was when life started shifting. The, the one exercise he made me do was write a letter of whatever I dreamt about at the time. And I said, I dream about becoming the world's greatest inline skater. And he said, dream big. And I said, that's the biggest dream I have, you know. So he said, okay, cool. So how do you achieve a dream? So think about it. See yourself as the greatest. What do you need? And I said, well, the first thing is I need rollerblades because I don't even have rollerblades. And he said, so how do you get it? And he made me write a letter, an application, and the whole process of achieving a dream. And I did the whole process and... I actually got the rollerblades and that's when I started believing and that's when I developed the process of getting what I wanted. From there, I just started using my anger and pain and hatred towards, just pushing towards my dreams and stuff. My Tricks is basically a biblical thing which I was exposed to at that time when life was hard. Um, if you look at my life, I started believing that I could be something when I was not. I started instilling in my mind that I could get out of that situation when I knew I was probably not. Um, so that's how the name came about. It was faith. Um, and if I read from the Bible, it says faith is the substance of things not seen. And, and that's what Mind Tricks is. I believed in something that didn't exist and I made it from step by step by step by step by step. And that's how Mind Tricks really evolved. I started understanding that it wasn't necessarily about what you learned in school. In any case, it was about what you learned from your life experience and reading. And I developed this joy for reading. So there's a lot of books on business. I started reading everything I possibly could about business. And funny enough, I, I applied to SAB Kickstart in my early days of business. And they asked, so Peggy, why do you want to win this money? And I think the funniest thing they kind of laughed at was I said, I'm not here to win any money. I'm just here to learn how to run a business because I don't know that, you know. So I used any opportunity I could possibly find to learn as much as I possibly could. From the SAB Kickstart competition where I was in the top 10 eventually, which was like a miracle. I was like, okay, I was just here to learn. Now I'm in the top 10. But anyway, I think I just took that learning thing and started applying everything. So I was like a sponge because I wasn't given enough education. I was like wanting to learn a lot, apply it very quickly. And I still wake up 4 a.m. in the morning. I spend my first hour reading on a subject I don't know. So I know and I make more informed decisions. So education played a really key role in developing the business.
Mind Tricks Media is a graphic design and web design agency based in Goods. Um, our core services is graphic design, web design, app development, developing sites. Um, we've developed a few complementary services such as printing, web hosting, and developing other marketing material for clients. So it's kind of a one-stop station for any business, any person looking to get a brand and marketing out there. Being in the township has really helped grow and really shape what we're all about. Being in the township has really been uh, quite an amazing experience for us because we started in Kailich and my bedroom, or I started in my bedroom, you know, and it developed from there and it went to Cape Town, Loop Street. But my one key thing was that it was kind of moving away from the vision as to why, why this company, why this dream. And I remember sitting with Ms. Vanelli and we said, um, why did we start Mind Tricks? And we started Mind Tricks to really kind of give what I was given to other people. At Mind Tricks, we have about eight people that work at Mind Tricks. Uh, five guys work full time, and then we've got three guys which work on virtual employment. So basically, that's part time, full time type thing. Um, they basically work on computers anywhere they want to work. Um, they get sent the project, and they kind of complete it, send it back to us, and we kind of manage from there. So I was basically given a um, free tertiary education by the Ruth Ross School of Art, which just kind of made me believe even more in, in different things and possibilities in life. And then they exposed me to concept, which did the same. And when I asked, what do I owe you? They said, all you need to do is to help one person. And that's it. If you've ever been exposed to the saying, you've, I'm sure you've obviously have been, which is um, give a man a fish and you fit him for a day, but teach him how to catch a fish and you fit him for a lifetime. I was given that. They exposed me to something which I never had and I took it and I became one of the best and it changed my life for a lifetime, you know, and I thought, how do I help someone do that? And that's how the internship uh, scholarship program came about with them, where I take kids from Ikas and I basically expose them to IT, graphic design, web design. And they come back, we give them internship, and some of the greatest we employ. We've got Mzwanele, he's done the course. Um, he's done it when I was actually lecturing at the time. Um, and uh, he's employed at Mindshix and he works full time. So we've kind of changed one person's life and it has grown and grown and grown. But coming back to the question, being a guy, he has helped me for, for that. That's the one that I really enjoy. That's why we have the business, you know, that we can actually provide a service, make income, but simultaneously change someone's life for a lifetime. On the internship program, we have currently about 36 guys. Um, that would include the first batch or the first intake, which was in January, um, including the one which I'm currently working on right now. So about 36 this year, last year we had 18 guys who successfully completed it. In the previous year it was the, the pilot too. So it's been a very successful program in getting two guys to 18 and now to about 36. As an entrepreneur, some of the greatest challenges that I've ever faced was obviously running a business without knowing how to run a business. So I was basically doing it out of passion and faith. You know, tricking my mind into believing that it can be successful, it can be possible. But um, some of the biggest one would probably involve me getting into accidents and not having systems and processes that run the business without me. So those were some of the biggest and recent challenges I faced where um, I had big personal problems, you know, um, and I had to be in hospital for some time in coma and the company had to run without me but we never prepared for that i didn't know i had to prepare for that the first international client we acquired was kevin wing um he heard about mind tricks from fundisi at the church so i think uh, the reverend started raving and ramping about us uh, because we were kind of developing the thing very slowly and quite well and going through it and we started doing some design work for the church as well. So I believe Kevin was at the center with the Reverend and he heard about this business. And when he went back to the US, he sent me an email and said, hey, I've got something I'm doing here. Um, but I mean, it just makes you believe in what you're doing. 
you know, if you get your first international client, you're like, okay, I think I'm on the right track. You know, so it just sparked a lot of excitement and we were really amped to kind of grow into it and do more and more and more. For me, um, one of my next biggest exciting tasks is to kind of uh, set up and complete the setup in Zimbabwe. Um, we've got a few guys in Mulawayo and Zimbabwe who are working on a satellite of mind tricks in Zim because obviously they've now changed the currency from a Zim dollar to a dollar which is 10 times more money than we make here. So we gave um, Solvip and the other guys some of our old equipment and kind of gave them ways of how they can set up the mind tricks there. So I need to go out and see those guys and kind of, because they're kind of running it already and I haven't even been there with them. So it's quite exciting getting calls from them. And I think to me, that's one of my next biggest thing, which is quite cool. Um, but apart from that is some other things where we've started working very hard on getting more international business. So we've got clients in Vietnam, in Rome, um, in Texas, in San Francisco, Angola. It's crazy just being in Googs and, and being able to kind of point all these different continents and say, hey, what clients there? Some of the language I still can't speak, but anyway, English kind of saves us. Um, so apart from establishing the different uh, the different uh, satellites and branches and running mind tricks from one head office is one of my next biggest steps and kind of seeing that but uh, one uh, daunting one for mind tricks which we're still working on is uh, starting with 600 rand and one computer and having mind tricks media on the JSC as a listed company I think that's one of the biggest goals that uh, I've got in mind at this point still fear full of it. Being featured on Forbes was like a very big milestone. Um, it was it was really one of those things where you don't believe it at first. You know, I thought it was a joke when they first said Forbes. Said the Forbes. And they said, yeah, we want to do a story on you. And I said, okay, I'll believe it when I see it, you know. So they arranged everything and took a flight down to Cape Town and I gave them the address and I told them where I was. I mean, at first I was thinking like, am I not too small for Forbes? I always say that with whatever you thrown in life, you can always flip it around. And my, 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 my funny version of my life story is I was thrown in hell and my life was hell. But I found in hell I could sell ice blocks. And I started selling ice blocks. From there, my business and my vision of my dream grew. And I started selling aircons in hell. And I sold cold water in hell. And I took all the profits and I bought a private jet and I flew to heaven. And my whole point about that is that you could be in any worse situation, but find a way that you can twist that and use it to your advantage. And then you are the only person that can take yourself from one point to the other. And my only advice is do it, do it. Learn everything you possibly can about the industry you wanna go into. Take your 600 grand and if you're passionate about this, you can do it. And my last thing would be that if I could take 600 grand one computer and turn this into what it is and more to come, so could you.